Hello, Dr. Rob. Can you good afternoon, me? Tammy. <laughs> How are you? I'm I can doing hear okay. you fine. So, yeah, that's good. I want to make sure all, everything's working. So. Good. So yes, we actually have- It's hard a, to do this. You know, we do this, no, I was just gonna say, we do this at the end of every Monday. And I've got to say, it's a little hard because Mondays are such a heavy day. And then we get to this point, it's like, ah. Oh. So I'm really glad to do this and um, and see folks and hear the good news before the day is over. Me too. Let's me go. Too. So again, for those of you joining us, we love your questions. You can put them in the Q&A at the bottom of the screen. Um, we will keep them as anonymous as possible. What is erotic rage? That's a great question. So Dr. Rob, what's your thoughts on that? Um, eroticized rage is a concept um, where there is a belief that people act out sexually because they're, they it's exactly what it says. It's that I um, am angry at someone and I use my sexuality in my anger. So you could say rape is a form of eroticized rage, but it's not that, it doesn't have to be that far along. It can simply, you know, let me back up. All the sex addiction and all addictions are about escaping your feelings, running away, all that stuff. So eroticized rage in a sense is just someone who has learned consistently to act out sexually um, as a result of their anger. And sometimes their anger goes into their sexual acting out. So not my best topic, but I think that's more or less right. And, and fair enough. Yeah, yes. I, I've heard very similar. Some to things what I know sharing. a lot about. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so just getting out of long-term toxic relationship. This is from a male. Going through withdrawal. Any recommendations to this withdrawal process? Um, I don't know whether you're involved with a man or not. Uh, doesn't matter, man or woman. You know, I say this a lot, I was saying this today on a podcast. Um, it doesn't matter whether someone's been abusive, whether someone's been mean, whether someone ignored you, whether their addiction was more important than you. It doesn't matter if you had to kick them out on their butt. There's still a part of us that remains connected to the people that we love and love and hate. You know, when you're angry at someone and hurt by someone and disappointed and feeling abused, it doesn't mean that your connection goes away. So rather than saying this is withdrawal, which I think is kind of pathological, why don't you instead say, you know, I had a deep, meaningful attachment to that person. And regardless of how it worked out, I'm st it's the holidays and I'm feeling a little lonely and I'm thinking about this person and all of a sudden, but, you know, just to say it, some of us, I don't know where you are in your world, don't want to feel a lot of things. And also we want to blame ourselves for our feelings or say that there's something wrong with them because we want them to go away or we want to figure them out. Feelings are just what they are. And you cannot blame yourself for still having feelings for someone that you spent a long time with and cared about, no matter how pathological they are. By the way, this is why some spouses will hang on to some addicts through thick and thin, no matter what. Um, you love us and you're willing to hang in there and make it work. So in any case, um, up for the next question. You're very well, quiet wanna, tonight, I, Tim. No, no, I'm, I'm actually, no, I'm going to tag on to this one because I was thinking, you know, I, I think it's really easy. And like you said, Dr. Rob, it, it's the holidays and, you know, people can overly romanticize, oh, that, you know, it was, yeah, I missed this person so much. And, and, but I hear you clearly saying a long-term toxic relationship. So, you know, I, I think being really keenly aware of what the positives and the negatives were, but like, why was it toxic? You know, being mindful of that, that you know, yes, there were these good things and, you know, and those are things that you miss and will grieve the loss of, but, but then there's the other mm -hmm. things. And, and so if the list of the cons of the relationship are far outweighing, you know, and not even numerically necessarily, but weight wise, you know, a, a toxic relationship, that means it wasn't safe for you. It wasn't good for you. So, so you, I think we all deserve to be in relationships with people who like Dr. Stan Tech can um, said on his podcast with Dr. Rob, you know, that healthy relationships were, we're stepping into the relationship. We're supporting the relationship. We're supporting each other, not just um, being selfish about me, me, me. So that was my two cents to add to that one. Actually, it's three cents because I took longer. That was a so. nickel. <laughs> okay. Can any therapist do a disclosure or and or polygraph or does it have to be someone who specializes in sex addiction? What is the procedure? This is one of those I um, want to bang my head on. I hate when general therapists well, let, are doing this kind of stuff. So please. So this share. is a multi. I'm sorry, I interrupted you. Yeah. Um, and your and your passion about this. Um, I think this is a multi-part question. So there's a yes. part two and a part one. If you can remind me of the part two. I'll go to the part one first. 
Um, okay. I do, I absolutely believe, and Tammy, I think will support this, that if you're going to go through something as gut-wrenching on parts of both people in a relationship like disclosure, I would want the absolute best people who knew what they were doing to support that process. There are lots of therapists who would say, never tell your spouse this, or only tell them parts of this, or, and they may not also understand addiction. So they may see your behavior in a different way than some of us would. So, you know, I think therapists in general, not all that great. I know a lot of therapists, not that great. The ones who are great, they know they're they know what they're good at and they know what they're not good at and i would suggest that a lot of therapists who really know what they're doing would say i don't i don't think i should take this on you know it's kind of like this if you had cancer you wouldn't go to a general practitioner you would go to a cancer specialist well you've got this problem or your relationship to this problem you need to go to a specialist for this too M many therapists can handle grief or disappointment or losses or um you know not knowing what direction you're going in life or depression i mean we're all trained for that but these issues take a specific higher level of, of kind of like a separate training, uh, kind of like when a doctor goes for a specialty. So no, I would not, especially disclosure. Like that's the one thing I would absolutely not suggest you do with someone who doesn't know what they're doing because it could destroy your relationship. And to tag on to that with the polygraph, you know, people, I had somebody ask me this and they're like, what about polygraphs? And I, I was like, there is no protocol for this yes. Yeah, Dr. Rob has talked about this with the, the peer consultation group. He runs a group for professionals. There are some amazing therapists that show up every week to get information, share information, get guidance and input on this. And we talk about disclosure a lot. We talk about polygraphs, all of those things. So there's no protocol. So having somebody just do a polygraph without it being part of, and like, what, what's the purpose of it? What are the questions you're going to ask? What are the expectations of this? You know, just doing a polygraph, you know, it, it isn't necessarily going to get you the truth that you're hoping for, the trust that you're hoping for, you know, any of those, you know. Um, so I, I just talked to somebody this weekend that was talking about their general therapist, probably a very nice person, well-trained marriage and family therapist, but they're, you know, they're, I mean, you, know, you talk about your hair going on fire that you don't have like I wanted to pull my hair out because I was like oh my gosh you know this is like it's so damaging for the couple so uh, I really do think it's highly important that you have the right help and to help you through the, I mean it depends on what you want if you're just looking for the truth and well first of all you know addicts lie so you probably won't get it but second of all if you're don't care about the relationship or healing, you know, being more traumatized by a poorly done disclosure happens all the time. So anyway, so and and was, then what is the, what is the procedure was the second part of it? Well, first I want to agree on the polygraph question, which is there is no protocol, meaning that those of us who are trained in sex addiction treatment are not, and I'm one of the trainers, <laughs> we do not train people in the use of polygraphs. It's become very popular because spouses really want, you know, they want that answer. And, and I understand that. But I would not use a polygraph except in cases where there was repeated lying, there were repeated visits to therapy, there were repeated attempts to deal with these issues because I really wanna give a spouse a chance to say, I love you and I have been on the wrong track, but I get it and I'm gonna be a stand up person and I'm gonna tell you the truth. They get one shot at that. If you've been through that already and then you find out there's more, then I would consider a polygraph. But I'm not talking about in your personal life where at a will tell you a little and then I'll tell you a little more. I mean, in therapy, in this process, if you, if you feel and have experience of this person being dishonest consistently, even though they really say they want to work on it, it may be useful to do polygraph. But even then, like Tammy said, you know, I used to think a polygraph was like this. Um, there are 15 questions and I have to answer all 15 and then it will say whether I lied or not. That's not what a polygraph is. Actually, what we do is you can only polygraph one or two questions. So basically what we do, and this is to the process part, is we will do a disclosure or a list for disclosure, and then we'll take it to the person who's been acting out and say, we want you to go to a polygraph. And when you go to the polygraph, here's the piece of paper that says all the behaviors that you lied to your spouse about or didn't tell them. Is there anything else? That's the question for the polygrapher. Is there anything you didn't say? Sometimes, if not unusually, we get uh, pre- I can say this word, pre-polygraphy confessions, where right before the polygraphy, someone says, oh, by the way, I want to add that, you know, that does happen. But again, I think before you go down that route, I would really want to go through this process a first time to see if that person can be worthy of my trust um, when we're starting again. 
So the point is get qualified professionals to help you. Okay, so I'm wondering how to support my husband as he tries to set new boundaries with his mom. Oh, he's been in recovery for a couple of years and continues to get help with his sex addiction and, and enmeshment. Uh, well, that's an interesting question because I don't know how a spouse can help. Like if I had profound maternal enmeshment, my mother was very ill and um, I think it was an inside job, like the work that I had to do in therapy and still have to, you know, do the, the work I did, the readings I did, the support I got, that's how help and the relationships I got in that were enmeshed <laughs> taught me how to, you know, maybe you can't always work through the past as you knew it, but you can work through the past in the present. So if I have an enmeshed relationship with a partner now, it is probably a reflection of the relationship that I had growing up. Um, and that may be fixable, the one from the past, maybe not so much. As a spouse, what I would encourage you to do is read a book called Silently Seduced, which is about maternal enmeshment. And I think that will give you, if nothing else, I think spouses, you should be educated. What is going on? What is he or she going through? What does this mean? How is it affecting our lives? Um, but I'm not sure as a spouse, you can't run interference for your partner. If he or she needs to set boundaries with their parent, they're gonna have to do that. And as much as I might want you to back me up, um, I don't want you to lie for me. I don't want you to tell, oh, the kids aren't able to, you know, I don't want you to lie for me. And I, and even if you say he's on the phone, he's not available, you're still lying for me. Part of my healing from that intensity of upbringing where you're so mushed in with a parent is separating from them myself and saying, mama or dad, I love you, but don't call. I need some space. You can't do that for them. What you can do is be empathic, nurturing, understanding. Wow, I can only, you know, when someone says to me, oh, I get what your childhood was like. It was a nightmare and you never had a chance. That's when I feel good because <laughs> I feel like someone sees me, but they don't need to help me with the problem. It's more letting us feel understood. I think that is the most important part. Tammy, do you have thoughts? I know you know Dr. I, Ken Adams who wrote yes, Silently Seduced. Yes, Silently Su Seduced and when he's married to mom and Dr. Rob did a podcast on sex, love and addiction um, with Dr. Adams, which I think you would find really helpful. But I was thinking the exact same thing you were talking about being empathic and things. And I, I was thinking if I said, you know, Dr. Rob, as my friend, I would say, Rob, Rob, you know, like I can see that that was a really hard phone call for you to have with your mom. And, you know, I just want you to know, you know, if, if I can listen, if you need to go call your sponsor, whatever, you know, but I think setting up the space and just acknowledging the, how difficult it is, but, you know, yeah, you, you can't run interference, um, but understanding, you know, how complicated it is, is a good thing. So yeah. you can bake cookies and say, when you're done with a chat with your mom, let's have a cup of, let's have a glass of milk and some cookies that I just made, like something to warm your heart. That's the yeah. stuff that spouses yeah. can do if they're in that place. Yes. Okay, next question. Thank you for your time and hard work. Question, every time I see specific girl, I want to regurgitate my heart, and it's in caps, so I don't know if that's a title of something. I don't know what it is, so I Well, you know what regurgitate means to- I know to what regurgitate Basically is. throw up food throw in your up, mouth. Yeah. So I'm not yeah. sure what that, yeah. my that's heart a heavy statement. starts beating fast, or I pretend she's not there in front of me talking to my friends. Why is that? How can I stop this behavior store? Oh, here. I was interested in specific girl, but something happened between us. Okay. So this is, this is a person, nothing mm -hmm. sexual or harmful. So that when, uh, uh, so that sh she went and said weird things about me to our group leaders, framing herself as a victim. Then my community group leaders kicked me out of the group for a few weeks. It really messed up my mind, but I'm starting to get better and regain some feeling of getting connected with my community again. Usually I'm outgoing and like having fun, but I get weird reserved around this specific person. It feels like it takes away from building meaningful and authentic relationships with individuals from my community group when she's around. I also feel like I, it, I found it difficult to now to trust, pursue women romantically. Any feedback appreciated? That's a long and complicated one. but there's a lot of questions. Bit. Yeah. And again, excuse me for changing the lights around. I'm used to having sunshine at this time of day. By the way, tell me one more thing. Did you notice the turtleneck? I did. did and that? I like the glasses, like the glasses and the, the turtleneck. The turtleneck is because it's actually under 
55 degrees here at night and I just, burr, and you know what I mean? Anyway, yes. let's get back to the question. There's a bunch of questions yes. in there. Can mm -hmm. you maybe frame that for me? So around this particular specific person, uh -huh. apparently there was anxiety, acted weird. And then that kind of got around the community, got kicked out, but trying to rebuild relationships. Right. But how do you, you know, how do you A, not act weird and B, you know, find out because he says, I'm finding it difficult now to trust, pursue women romantically. So because of this particular situation. Well, it sounds like a very specific situation and it's a little hard to weigh in on communities and individuals. And, but I think Tammy's right. The word is anxiety, you know, um, whether it's from past issues or current issues or maybe what happened in the community. And I don't think there's a lot you can do about that. I mean, if you're anxious all the time, that would be something you can do. But in relationship to this specific person, a situation, you know, you have a couple of choices. You can move toward it which doesn't sound like the right thing to do here. You can ignore it, which will allow you to function in your community. Or you can, uh, uh, what else can you do? You can run, you can leave, you can leave the community and do something else. But if you're gonna stay in that community, I think that you have to find a way to tolerate your feelings and not approach her and not engage with her. And you know, I've had, not Tammy, but certainly people at work that I, you know, I didn't like them and we weren't friends, but I had to work around them and they were in my community. And so we found a way to coexist. Um, so there's that. Um, there's another part of that question, I think, about. And I, and I was kind of thinking about like, because the group leaders picked out and things like that, too. And I was like, OK, so how do we, you know, how do you learn to be different around the, the group? So that they understand that that was like a one off, you know, like around this person, you're going to act strange, but. Not. There's nothing. I think the more, I, I think the question that remains unanswered is I feel uncomfortable now going out and dating, and I'm afraid this is going to happen with someone else again. And, you know, I do not believe that one experience defines our dating. Maybe something happened with this person that brought up stuff from the past, or you're already kind of shy and, you know, not sure of yourself, and this really sent you spinning. But, um, but here's a thought about dating. Tell me, I think I've told you this before. I went to a dating course years and years ago when I was single and there were all these therapists in there because it was a conference and we were all there to learn about dating. But the truth was we were all trying to figure out how to date. But anyway, one of the things we all looked at each other like, you're not here for clients, are you? But um, one of the things I remember from that experience was they said that dating is a numbers game and you have to date lots of people before you, you know, they actually said 15, 20 people a year. And I can't imagine that because most of us date two or three times and we either give up or we settle for the person we found. So maybe what would help you is to realize that there are at least 150 million women in the United States, if that's where you live. And I would say, you know, 25% of them are single. So maybe there's a whole bunch of other people. And maybe part of the problem is putting so much energy on any one person. Because dating is about getting to know someone. You know, it isn't about intensity. It isn't necessarily about magic, although it's nice if it's there. So maybe if you just push yourself to do more dating, especially online, now that we're not necessarily going out and meeting people, it feels so much safer to chat with someone like this. And just don't leave the game. Don't let your anxiety, your neurosis, your bad experience get in the way of your having a happy life with someone else. Um, you know, walk right through that. And if you can't get some help walking through it. So next question, if someone believes they are not a true porn addict, but they are a concerning user, do they still need a CSAT to help them overcome or can a regular therapist help? I wrote a book about this, I have to say, and it's, I don't even remember, I don't remember the title. Um, there's a more, so I wrote Sex Addiction 101, but before that, and Tammy, this is a general path book um, that I wrote with Jennifer, um, something about sex Closer addiction. Closer together, again. further apart. No, that's a book about tech, but there's okay, there then, is a um, book about sex addiction that she starts with together. an A. Let me, mm, I'm gonna look it up. It's okay, Sorry. but anyway, in this book, I wrote about um, I wrote about this question. <laughs> Sorry, I wrote about um, um, I was gonna say about dating and recovery, but that isn't quite what I wanted to say. Um, Always turn you know, on. Yeah, Always Turned On, thank you, is a book that gives a lot more definition and information. Thank you, Tammy. The Sex Station 101 was written as a, as a basic primer. You know, if you don't have any idea what this is and you're in recovery kindergarten, you know, here's what it's all about. 
But that book was written as a real complete view of sex and relationship addiction. And in there, there's a lot of conversation about dating and fear of intimacy and something else that you mentioned that I, oh, and the porn problem. So I wanna say something about that. So in that book, and this is why I brought it up, we talked about three levels of problems. And when we're talking about porn, what we talked about in that book, say the name again, Tammy, it's called Always, Always turned, turned on. on. We talked about three different levels of porn users. We talked about casual users who occasionally go to the porn and, you know, someone's away, they're alone, it's not a big deal, you know, they occasionally once in a while, and or even often sometimes. And then we talk about the concerning user who is really using every time they get upset, really running to the porn every time they're having a bad day. They're really using the porn as a crutch um, to tolerate whatever's going on in their life. But if asked, they could put it down. If, or if they said, I get this a problem for me, I'm not gonna, you know, I don't wanna do this now, I wanna focus on other things. Um, that's what the challenged user can do. But then there's also the addicted user. And it's not hard to tell that if you're addicted because number one, your behavior, in this case, the porn is getting, getting interfering with your life. It's causing you to be isolated. It's causing dating problems. It's causing relationship problems. If you're having problems in your life related to porn, you're not studying, you're not doing as well at work, your partner thinks you're ignoring them, and you keep using the porn, then you've got a problem. And the question is, can you stop and get away from it? Or, can, or do you need um, to uh, really get into treatment and get some kind of help for that? By the way, I do want to say that, that there are different varieties of people who struggle with porn. So first of all, the, por the term porn addict doesn't really exist. It's a made up term because we don't have a diagnosis for porn addiction. We don't have a lot of research about porn addiction. So I don't disagree that it's an addiction. It's just that we don't have the, the formal therapy language to call it that. So I'm going to say that people who have compulsive problems with pornography usually fall into different categories. Some of them started looking at porn very early and it became like seven, eight, nine years old and it's become their go-to comfort, distraction and they are basically very, very compulsive about it. But if you work with these people and you take the porn away and I'm talking about people who are 25, 27, young folks, you take the porn away and you refocus them on a recreational life, a connected life, a dating life and you really push them into being around and engaging with people they're not that interested in the porn anymore. So you could say it's more like a learned problem or a conditioned problem, but there are other people who are full on sex addicts. They have a porn problem, but they also have problems with sex workers and cam girls or boys, and they're also you know, hooking up on apps and they have a broader problem. There are people who call themselves porn addicts who actually have very deep religious convictions and values against porn, but they keep looking at it and they think there's something wrong with them because they're looking at something that is against their values and their beliefs. So there are people, sorry to go on and on, who have major mental health disorders like mania and obsessive compulsive disorder and ADD, and they too can be drawn to problematic patterns of porn use. So uh, all I would say is if you really think you have a problem, go see a professional. And one of them, again, who knows what they're doing with this, because I've worked with people who say, I know I have a porn problem, it's messing up my life, and they go to that therapist who is loving and sweet and warm, but they're trained to say, well, now don't you feel bad about that porn, you just use as much as you want, because porn is not a big deal. They don't understand what you're really doing. So that's why, you know, it's like, oh, I have a few too many drinks, but they don't ask how many, they don't ask what you're drinking, they don't know what to do if you, you know, you really want to go to an expert. And I think if you have this question, Unfortunately, there's not a lot of literature. One more thing, and I'm saying forever, sorry, Tammy. Uh, I'm writing a book about this that will be out, I'm thinking first quarter of next year about porn problems and the problem with porn. And I'm gonna list, I am listing all of these different kinds of issues that lead to porn problems. And then going into what is the difference between recovering from a porn addiction versus larger problems. So if you can wait till March, <laughs> I'll have a book out for you. In the meantime, there's a fair amount of research and you can look up porn, compulsive porn, addictive porn, you'll find all kinds of articles and stuff like that. Well, and you did a number of podcasts on this topic as well. And you touched on something like when you, when you have an expert, they're going to ask you, how much are you drinking? What are you drinking? And it's the same with porn, like, because, you know, your definition of porn, my definition of porn, and this person's all can be very different. And so understanding, and there's so many different forms of, you know, whether it's anime, elder, underage, I mean, like there's so many different types of porn. It's really important for the professional to understand what that, what that is so that they are able to identify and look, dig, dig a little deeper on, you know, on why it could possibly be a problem. 
You know, I, I want to say one more thing about porn um, in general, which is that I've heard people who look at a lot of porn say, oh, I got into things I never liked. I never, that, that make me feel horrible. You know, I'm looking at, I don't know, grandmothers having sex or I'm, you know, looking at foursomes or whatever it is and, or maybe BDSM or some kind of kink. And I've heard people say, it's the porn that made me do it. I never would have had this interest if it wasn't for the porn. And when I stop looking at the porn, that interest is gonna go away. And that's not really true. Um, what porn does is it helps us sometimes identify parts of our, what we would call arousal template or what arouses us that we weren't aware of before. You know, I wasn't aware that pain was pleasurable to me until I, until I saw somebody with handcuffs, handcuffs and a little whip. And I thought, oh, that looks like fun. By the way, that doesn't mean I want to go do it. Just because we enjoy something in pornography does not mean we absolutely want to do it in the world. Um, lots of people have fantasies that they want to look at, but they don't necessarily want to act out. So porn doesn't make you do it. If you are looking at something that would never really arouse you, it doesn't matter where you look at it a thousand times, it's still not gonna arouse you. It's not the porn that made you do it. It's the porn that led you to parts of yourself that you didn't know about. So this person continues, how do you approach someone you know is struggling with porn if you feel they are ashamed of the addiction? Tell me what, you know what? I'm gonna ask you and I'll tell you why. So many people, so we run a treatment center called Seeking Integrity and we treat men in residential treatment. They live with us. I mean, not with us, but in our program. Um, and they're dealing with, and they often calling Tammy and saying, gosh, I'm not sure if I have a problem or not. I'm not sure what to do. I have this girlfriend, wife, whatever, our boyfriend I want to approach. I'm not sure what to say. So Tammy gets these questions all the time. So I'm going to defer to you to start this one and see if I have anything else to throw in. Oh, I bet you will. So, so I... I mean, many people, so the ashamed is always part of that. I mean, people come to treatment, we, we are working on their shame. So I think it's more, you know, when Dr. Rob was talking at the last question about, um, you know, inviting them to engage in life in a meaningful way, if they are able to do so, and then the porn was just a distraction, maybe it is a problem, maybe it isn't. Sometimes it's bringing information into their world of like, I listened to this podcast and it was really interesting. We have a self-assessment on seekingintegrity.com. It's just a little quick scan and people can go, oh, I might have an issue. I might need to look into that more. So, so there's so many different ways of broaching the subject um, or, you know, like you seem to have been disengaged. Is there something going on? You know, are you spending too much time on you know, line, whatever. I mean, and gaming, a lot of it is gaming, gaming and porn. I'm seeing so much correlation between the two and there's porn within the gaming. I mean, so it's very complicated, but I think just having the, if it's really a person you care about being able to have a, I need to have a difficult conversation with you. Are you able to, you know, are you able to listen to this? I care about you. You know, you've been very distant, you know, what, whatever you're seeing, but, you know, I'd, I'd like to have, I'd like to see if we can find a way to help support you in a different way. So your thoughts, unless you're uh -huh. married to that person or you're in a relationship oh. with that person, um, a meaningful romantic relationship in which a case, I think kindness, warmth, compassion may go out the window and it may become, why are you looking at this one? We don't have sex anymore. Why are you looking at this one? I keep saying you're distant and you never tell, you know, it will be a different and much more, I hope, assertive and direct interaction if it is your spouse or partner or lover who has been doing this, you know, either behind your back or in ways that are affecting you. But if you're a friend, you know, I think it's so much easier to be compassionate, say, you know, this isn't about my life, this isn't affecting me, but I really care about you. And I've heard you talk about this, or I've heard you, you know, and I wonder, and then I've heard you talk about things you want and goals you have. And I wonder if these things are getting in the way. I mean, that's a compassionate friend. And they can say, screw you, I'm not going to talk about this, or how dare you? Okay, I just meant to support you. And if that didn't work, please forgive me. Um, but for spouses, it's different. You have your own strong feelings about this that have to be expressed for yourselves. Yes, and I was taking this completely as a friend because that's, that's the tone I was saying. Okay, all right. Next question, because we've got a bunch. Why do some addicts get recovery and some do not? That is the eternal question. It seems just such a complicated process, denial, self-justification, intimacy, avoidance, et cetera. Why do some get it and just seem to be able to, and, um, and just seem to be able to, is it a lack of desire to get recovery or something else? My husband seems very genuine about getting help, but things got worse instead of better. And I'm wondering why we're now in the process of a divorce I, and look what he's lost. Look, he look what he's lost because of addiction. So, Ugh. 
So, I mean, I, first of all, there are many answers to your question. You know, people have all kinds of problems. Let me just say it this way. Sex and porn addiction, intimacy disorders, love addiction, all that stuff is the tip of the iceberg of problems that are underneath. Um, you know, we all have issues. If you're in this room or you're involved with someone who has these issues, you understand that. So, you know, I might have profound depression. I might have a lot, of, you know, I might have emotional issues that have prevented me from being able to get to that place of getting sober. Sober. I may be so damaged emotionally and from earlier experiences that I can't really get it together. You know, I, I give up on myself or, you know, it could be that this person needs to go to treatment. And I think that is one of the reasons, by the way, if you, for any of you, if you, how do you know if treatment is like going to a treatment center is useful? Cause you've tried everything else. You've been to 12 step meetings, you go to therapy, you've been seeing a psychiatrist for meds, you know, you've done the couples work, you're doing everything you can and you still can't quite really get time together. Um, or you're having profound trauma or anxiety come up in relation to trying or the relationship is so bad. When it is people, when people are having those kinds of crises and they don't know how to move forward, I think residential treatment is really, really helpful. Um, but in this situation, um, you know, it could also be, and I just want to say this, that people, people do things very passively at times. And it may be that this person didn't want to be in a relationship or didn't want to be in a relationship with you for a long time. And this was their out to say, oh, I can't get better, you know, to leave you feeling like I can't live with this. Sometimes people act out to try to encourage a partner to leave without actually being direct about it. The last thing I want to say besides, besides it's a hidden message or maybe emotional illness is there um, is simply the fact that it's, this is a hard process. It took me three years to get any meaningful sobriety. And so part of my question is what do you mean by getting it? Because if you said, you know, someone was going to 12 step meetings as an alcoholic and they were going to therapy and they got nine months sober and then they returned to drinking. I wouldn't say that they're starting again. I wouldn't say that they didn't mean to or weren't trying. I would just say that maybe they missed something or we need to dig harder or they need more support. So I'm just saying that sometimes people don't get well because, um, because uh, they, they don't have the motivation, they don't have the support, they don't have the places to go. And, and one last thing I wanna say, you know, people ask me a lot, like, how do you get somebody to wanna get well? And I gotta tell you, you know, and I'll, this, I'll give an example. When I used to do a lot of media, you know, when CNN and, and HLN and all those, you know, when we're doing a lot more talk on TV rather than talking about politics, um, people used to ask me this question, um, which is, you know, how do I know this person's really committed to this or how I know they're gonna get better? And the answer, and the way they would ask this in the media was, you know, this person must be going to treatment just as an excuse. They want everyone to feel sorry for themselves. They're getting out of their lives and going to treatment so everybody will think they have a problem when they're really just crazy sex people or whatever you want to call them, perverted. And I agree that most people come to treatment because they're in trouble. You know, they have a consequence and something bad has happened there, you know, and that is why they get help. So the one thing I cannot do in therapy is I cannot deeply motivate you to change your life. I can get you to look at yourself, to figure out what's wrong, to take other steps, what happened to you, how to avoid the problem, how to not get in more trouble with your spouse. But the one thing that I can't do is deeply inside of you come to a place of, I don't want to do this anymore. Because folks, whether you like it or not, acting out is fun. Tammy will tell you that when she drank, she had a hell of a time until she couldn't drink anymore. And sex addiction is fun until it isn't anymore. So a couple of things. Number one, sobriety or a lack of sobriety doesn't mean someone isn't trying, doesn't mean they're not doing their best. Um, this is a very difficult issue. And let me just add to that. This isn't alcohol. You know, you can stop drinking and have a very happy life without ever drinking again. You can have a gambling problem, have a very happy life without ever, no more casinos, no fantasy football, no more stock market. But when it, terms to, comes, when it comes to problems like sex or eating, which are naturally occurring functions that have run off the rails, you know, I have to deal with food every day. I have to hopefully in some way deal with sexuality every day or, or regularly. So moderating, managing, containing behaviors that have been out of control and now, but are not gonna be eliminated, not gonna stop having sex, stop eating, that's actually harder than just stopping. And no disrespect to that drug addicts and alcoholics, all the people who struggle out there, but you can put your stuff away and never look at it again. And that's the goal. And those of us eating, those of us who have eating disorders and sexual disorders, we need to look at that stuff for the rest of our lives. 
keeping it in a healthy fashion is a regular struggle um, that will go on all of our lives. Yeah, yeah my, my thought was, I don't know what the time span is, but yes, it gets worse before it gets better because if he's stopping the behavior and he doesn't have the tools to manage life, now all the all of the things that, all the reasons why he was acting out are now he's having to confront. And that is so uncomfortable. Another reason to come to treatment because, you know, we, we really help with that, you know, and move things much quicker. So, but, but again, as Dr. Rob said, you can't change somebody's motivation. And if they absolutely refuse to, but I'm going to disagree with you. Like drinking was fun. Drinking and drugs was fun for a time. And then I was just yeah. chasing. No, then I was just chasing the fun that I thought I was going to have. It had stopped being fun. I had negative consequences. Like I'm well, won't go, but like, like it, there were very little fun towards the end of my career with that. So, but I, as someone with an eating disorder in recovery, it is a daily basis. I, I am like not as mindful on some days as others, you know, I kind of have a routine and things like that, but Thanksgiving, you know, like, I, like you, I had to learn to be okay with, you know, it's, it's just going to be, it's a holiday. It's one day. I'm going to give myself some grace. These are the thoughts I had to go through in order to not be, you know, freaking out at Thanksgiving. So it's a daily thing, but I have, I have to tell you, Tammy, I mean, this probably won't get recorded, but I, I was tortured at Thanksgiving because I've been on a diet, as you know, and I'm trying really hard and I lost 10 pounds. Yes, yay. But Thanksgiving, I was like, how, it's going to ruin everything. And, and the next day I thought, oh my God, I've gained 20 pounds. You know, I have them crazy like that too. Mm -hmm. And I looked on the scale today and I'm the exact same way I was when I, you know, before Thanksgiving. So, mm -hmm. um, but these fears about parts of our functioning that are so profound and deep, they're really a hardship to turn. You know, I remember people talking about the economy, the American economy back in the recession. And they said, you know, an economy in a, in a country like ours is a very, very big ship and it takes a long time to turn it. And I think these issues are very similar. I've been living my way, my life my way for 25 years or 30 or 40 and that's how I've coped and that's how I've managed and like it or not, whether it hurts you or not, that was the best I could do in that to, during that time, right or wrong. And, uh, and so to relearn those ways of thinking and doing that have been survival skills for me for much of my adult life is a day by day thing. But for those of us who get it and continue to pursue, it is so worth it. You know, what, what I gave up the fun was nothing compared to the, to the gifts I've given. So, I, so I'm sad for you. I'm really sad for your, for your husband, who's you know, I mean, he's, he's losing you. He's losing, you know, so that it's just sad. So, but I'm glad you're here. And let me, and let me say one more thing to you and every partner in the room. I will say this regularly. There is nothing that you can ever do to make somebody have this problem. There's nothing you can really do to make them uh, change their problem. Um, there's certainly nothing you ever do on any day that can cause them to do this. You know, addicts act out because we want to, especially once we understand the problem. Um, so, you know, you can make me miserable, you can let me down, you can hurt me, you can disappoint me, and I can go for a walk. I don't have to, or I can divorce you. But the answer is not to go look at porn and cheat or drink. I mean, those are solutions for somebody who doesn't have the strength inside to find their, another way. Next question. Thank you, Dr. Rob and Tammy, for all you do. It has been so helpful and, and a wonderful resource and support for me. I listened to an interview with Dr. Rob and Troy Love today. He said that he sees a great disconnect when the spouses feel their pain suffering is so intense that they cannot hold space for the other person suffering. I understand my husband has a disease and I want to help him through past and current trauma pain, but my husband doesn't have any or very little empathy for me and seems to be holding on to his rights and not fully accepting responsibility for his repeated lies and betrayals. How can a betrayed wife hold space for the addicted husband when it feels like they won't recognize or fully admit their wrongdoings? Well, I don't think that's your job. I don't think it is ever a partner's job to hold that space for healing for us. I think that's sponsors are for, that's what therapists are for, that's what 12-step groups are for, that's what we're for, and all of the free groups that we give away. By the way, that consultation I group do for therapists every week, that's free too, I want to say. So, um, sorry, back to the question. Um, um, your job as a spouse, and I say this a lot, you have three or four once you've discovered betrayal, one is to be angry and as angry as you need to be and as angry as you want to be for a while. 
Number two is to think out what, about whether or not you want to live with this person or continue with this person. And the third thing is self-care, you know, really finding a place to deal with your pain and disappointment by getting as much support as you need, whether that's a massage or a night out with friends or going to a support group. But none of you spouses can ever, ever make us act out or make, no one can make Tammy drink. We, we can make Tammy miserable. We can make Tammy sad. Tammy can get very angry. I've seen it. But drink, that's her decision. And sometimes addicts will put that responsibility on us. Like, well, if you hadn't said this, or if you just lost more weight, or, you know, if you weren't so frustrating all the time, that's the addict's denial that it's easier to put it on you than it is to take responsibility myself. But for all your partners are thinking, well, if I just said this or I shouldn't have said that, do what you need to do. We, you, we are responsible for our healing. You are responsible to let us know what we've put you through and how you feel about it. And, and I agree. And I think you're living the disconnect right now. I mean, he can't hold the space for you. You are, I mean, that's the disconnect. So, so, but, yeah, everything Dr. Rob just said, you know, I agree with. <laughs> and if he needs treatment, we have a great treatment center that can help. Okay, next question. Oh, this is an interesting one. What does trauma work look like for an addict using a codependent model? You know, I, I really don't believe in codependency and I don't believe in the codependency model. Um, I've written a book called Prodependence, which is really a 180 degree turn on codependence. The, the codependency model basically says, uh, if you're involved with an addict, there's something wrong with you for having gotten involved with them. There's something wrong with you for staying with them. And if you, even if you get away with them, if you don't away from them, if you don't look at your own stuff, you're gonna end up with another version of them. And I just don't think there's any reason to go after and ask that level of self-examination from someone who loves someone who's in a crisis. You know, when someone is, has a heart attack or cancer, you don't say to their partner, well, you better work through your trauma to, because you've been spending too much time taking care of them. They say, how great that you're taking care of your loved one who's sick, we admire you, let us give you a night off and here's a casserole. So why would anyone say to a partner or a loving parent, you know, this person's addiction is a real struggle. And let's look at how you have been supporting the problem or part of the problem. Partners and spouses are not part of the problem. Even if you as a spouse are not handling the problem well, you're nagging, you're complaining, you're doing, you become someone you don't want to be. That doesn't mean that you in any way can cause us to do anything that unless we choose to do it. So um, trauma. Under the codependency model, what they're asking you to do is look at your issues as they're playing out in your current relationship. And the better in touch you are with the brokenness of your past, the easier it will be to heal your present. And I don't think the past has anything to do with the crisis when you're living with an addict. When you live with an addict, they're the problem. And your problems are in relationship to it because you're living with someone who's a mess and your home is in constant crisis. So to me, what I see that we call codependency, you know, words like enmeshed, I'd rather say deeply caring, you know, words like enable, I would rather say, we'll do anything they do to help their family member. I mean, I think there are very positive ways that we can look at the, the hard journey of a loved one or a family member of an addict without asking them to devalue or dismiss or pick themselves apart. You know, if some of you want to self-examine and go to therapy after your loved one has gotten sober, after the crisis is over, you know, when things are better, great. You know, self-discovery is a wonderful thing. But I don't think anyone needs to go to therapy for what they did wrong in a relationship that turned out to be addictive. Do you guys, spouses, need therapy? Absolutely. What do you need it for? Is it the same as the addict? No. You need, you need therapy for support. You need therapy to validate your reality. You need therapy to grieve the relationship you thought you had versus what you really have. But there is nothing wrong with your spouses that peace and quiet and wholeness in your home wouldn't help with. That was a bad sentence. But bring no, your life back I, into balance. Following have, the addict, have the addict come to peace with their addiction and your life will get better. And if you still don't like yourself in your life, then go take a look at yourself, but not until the crisis has passed. And uh, yeah, I just don't, I think codependency is a harm that's actually been visited on loving people, mostly women, to ask them to question the love that they give. And I don't think the love we give should ever be questioned. Next question, how to control self-destructive behaviors? 
So I'm not sure what that means by self-destructive. Do you have a thought about that, Tammy? Well, yeah, I was like, like I can't control, like the, the, in 12 step, we talk about surrender to win, you know, like the more I tried to control my acting out behavior, my drinking, my drugging, whatever, the, the more I was focused on it and the more it, like, I just, I absolutely failed. And then I failed and then I was shamed and all of that. It was a vicious cycle. The, the more I got support to intervene on it, the, that's, that's when things shifted. So for me, I, I still know I cannot control you know, my addiction, I can do the things I need to do in order to stay in recovery today. And that's what I do. So that's, you know, that's my, you know, like, why, why do I, and I did a lot of therapy. Why did I do those self-destructive things? You know, so that was helpful for me. And, and Tammy, you know, I really appreciate you're looking at it in terms of addiction. Um, I'm thinking about a larger thing, which is, People sometimes think they sabotage themselves at work, mm. in their creativity, in their relationships. And here's another concept I don't believe in, self-sabotage. I don't think any of us want to ruin our lives or sabotage. I think we do things in the way we do them and we make mistakes or we don't know any better or we're broken. But I don't think it's ever our intention, conscious or unconscious, to hurt ourselves or hurt others unless we're really, really, really troubled. Um, but when you say self-destructive, I think that needs more definition. If in terms of addiction and relationships and the intimacy issues we're talking about and you destroy relationships, you hurt yourself with your sexual behavior, you know, you're on the right track. You know, we're the right place for you. But issues like I keep losing jobs, I keep letting myself down, I, I can't follow through on things, I, you know, things that tr I lose all my money and then I, I can't pay my bills. I mean, truly what you might call self-destructive things, I think there are always places to go work on that, as Tammy said. For example, people who have struggle, trouble with money, either you overspend or you underspend. Um, there's a Debtors Anonymous program that I loved and spent time with because it actually helps a lot with other addictions, I think. It has a lot of concepts I like. But whatever your self-destructive behavior is, if it's persistent and consistent, there is a support group for that. And, and to that point, I just want to say to all of you, you know, we have 14 groups a week on sexandrelationshiphealing.com. They're all free. They're just like, this is one of them. You know, We have support groups for addicts, support groups for partners, support groups for men and women and couples and all that kind of stuff. Um, so it may well be that if you go online and you type in support groups for self-destructive behavior, you're gonna find a whole bunch of information. Um, you know, it's funny, Tammy, I don't mean to be dismissive, but you know, people call for questions, right? They call, what is this, what is that? And not often, but sometimes if they just Googled the question, they would find the answer. And in this case, I think there's so much information on self-destructive behavior and so many groups that are there to support you. Um, I would suggest joining others who have been through what you've been through, who are working through it, and you can use as role models. Next question. My essay husband gave me restitution letter, waited six months since impact letter was shared, did not consult a CSAT did not address all things, felt it was not complete, did not want to address the impact. Denial appears to be very high still. I rejected the letter and asked him to consult a CSAT. Is this an example of a part of denial or is this example part of denial? What do you suggest for him to better address denial? You start and I'm gonna finish. I, I, like I, to me, hmm. I'm wondering what his level of commitment and working with his therapist is. And beyond that, I've said a bunch of times on here, if, if somebody's just going to a therapist once a week and that's all they're doing to combat something that is probably decades old, you know, underlying issues, it's not enough. But um, I don't know what the boundaries were. I don't know what, when you did disclosure, what the, uh, what the boundaries for providing the restitution letter. But to me that, you know, that sounds like either things weren't set in place to have a clear understanding of what it was supposed to be. And clearly he didn't consult his CSAT. So this feels like a, a treatment failure. I'm thinking it's not enough. So go ahead. And I, you know, we have this statement about denial. And if you run the letters down, it's uh, didn't even, didn't even know I was lying. Um, uh, and what we mean by that is people in denial are lying to people in denial are lying to themselves. And so 
you may help them look at something that's a truth and they're going to fit it into their worldview and they're going to make it your fault or they're going to ignore it. To be honest, the only thing that really can help with denial is the direct and honest truth. And I have to say to you spouses, you know, I, I, and some of you guys, we have a bunch of people in treatment right now and the people who are in treatment are always sitting here listening. So, um, so what was I going to say about that? Um, um, and one of the things we talk to them about is, you know, is that I can say something when I walk into one of the clients and they'll say, it's like, wow, that was amazing. I never thought of it that way. And then they'll say half the time, you know, my wife says that to me all the time, but this is the first time I've been able to hear it. So sometimes what people do is they put us, partners, spouses, family members in a box and all they hear is wah, 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 wah. They don't actually hear what we're saying. But if, a, if somebody else comes in, that they don't know and they can't push away. And that person says, I mean, this is part of what we do in treatment. We put it all up on a wall and say, well, you say you love your family. You say you love, you want to keep your job, but let's look at all the things you did to hurt your family and hurt your job. This is your denial that you could do these things and still do, still try to be in your family or be successful is your denial because it's going to get in the way. But until someone is ready to see how and in what ways they're destroying their own lives, you can't make them. So next question. Well, actually, the next is a comment. I just finished reading Out of the Doghouse, and I can see how doing what you recommend has helped me rebuild trust in my wife. So that's good. Okay. So I'll sell that book. I wrote yeah. a book called Out of the Doghouse because in 25 years of doing this work, I have never yet met, ran into a man who knew how to heal the way he had hurt a woman through betrayal or cheating. Guys, we just think of it as like, well, I dropped the plate, I glued it back together. It's been a month. Why isn't it better? Or why are they still so angry? Or, you know, guys are very answer driven. So we want to find the solution to your anger, to your disappointment. And we want to solve it, whether that's us showing you how much we care or sending you flowers or, you know, whatever. And that's not what heals this. What heals it is time and really consistent, healthy behavior over time. I mean, that we can see and watch. So, um, Words don't matter. Um, oh, we've got a new question. Words don't matter, actions do. And when I'm gonna confront someone, by the way, I confront them because I really believe their actions are not matching up to their words. Next question, I struggle with lying. I feel like I have, imp I know, I, like I hear from okay. partners all the time, he lies. And I was like, of course he does, every addict does. I struggle with lying. I feel like I have improved since I first walked into the rooms. I lie because of fear, the fear of being rejected or abandoned. How can I overcome this? I go to meetings, therapy and make program calls. I intellectualize recovery and the program. How can I overcome the fear of letting people get close to me and know who I am? Well, those are two different questions. So can we do the lying one first yes. and the letting people get close to me second? Yes. Okay. So um, I have a little rule. First of all, if a lot of, let me back up. One of the challenges addicts have and sex addicts in particular is being assertive. Um, we don't, we avoid conflict. We can yell the hell out of somebody, but actually someone coming to us, we don't like conflict. We avoid conflict. If we understood how to deal with it, we wouldn't act out sexually or with drugs or whatever. So conflict is difficult for us. We don't. And so when I, when I've lied to you, even if it's, yeah, I said, I took the garbage out this morning, but I didn't. Um, you are, sorry, I was going to, what did I want to say there? Oh, you're going to see my angry face when I say, I know you didn't take out that garbage and you're going to want to lie. So you say you took it out, but you really didn't. And you don't want me to get upset. So you lie to me. And then I look in the garage and there's that garbage that you never took out. I'm going to be furious. And I'm going to come up to you and say, if you lie about this, you could be lying about anything. And a lot of times it's just very hard for us addicts to face the absolutely deserved uh, aggression and disappointment in people in the faces of those we love and tell the truth. It's just very difficult. But what we can do, and this is the bargain I make with everybody who has this problem, is what you can do is you can make a commitment to your sponsor, to your family, to your partner, to your therapist, that in the moment you may lie. In the moment, it may be so hard for you to be truthful and you're so afraid of rejecting everything that you will just not to tell the truth. Fine. But the agreement is that I will come back to you within 24 hours and I will tell you the truth. 
when I used to see people outpatient, they were even in seeking integrity, I say, look, I know you're going to lie to me because you lie to everybody. And that's fine. I lied too when I was in my addiction actively. But um, just let me know. You know, just call me in 48 hours and say, I lied. I'm really sorry. That was really hard for me. It's all good. It's kind of like forgiveness. You know, you in a relationship, Tammy can hurt me, disappoint me you know, uh, make me mad. But as long as she can come back and say, well, you know, I think this is my part and this is your part, then I can hear it and I can work with it. If I'm in relationship with someone who just lies and they don't own their part, that makes me crazy. And that's not a relationship I want to be in. So let's talk about the, how can I overcome the fear of letting people get close to me and know who I am? Well, this is a really interesting question because this is the essence of intimacy. It is the key to intimacy. Intimacy is not about sex. Intimacy is not about, you know, falling in love or romance. Intimacy is about being known. Some of the people I'm most intimate with are people I went to high school with, and we're friends 40 years later. I know everything about these people. They know everything about me. There's no secrets, nothing to hide. They knew me when I was 17. So I'm not saying you have to have long relationships that long, but intimacy is about being known. If I have the guts to say to you, you know, I'm really disappointed when you went away for the weekend and didn't do blah, blah, blah. Um, that means I am willing to be intimate with you because you may say, screw you, or you may say, I don't want to hear that. Or you may say, well, I'm really concerned about how you feel. If I move towards you by revealing myself, and I'm not talking about addiction, I'm talking about healthy relationships or ones that are not clogged by drama. Um, if I go up and I say, you know, I've been meaning to tell you this for a really long time. It's uncomfortable. It's embarrassing. Here you go. Um, I know that we're being intimate if you're listening and you're not judging me and you're curious about what I said. Um, I can tell whether somebody is really motivated for me to be intimate with them or they're not. And it's very simple. Are they able to hear what I have to say? Are they able to accept me and listen without judgment? Um, those are the key. And are they able to ask for more? Because intimacy or are they willing to share a little bit about themselves so we can be mutually intimate? I think that one of the most intimate things you can do with someone you're truly connected to and truly love is have sex. Because making love and having sex with someone that you care about is being very vulnerable. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know about you, Tammy, but I don't like this little bulge I have here and I hate this little part and I don't like that, you know, but and when I'm naked with somebody, they're gonna see all of that, especially I, someone I've loved deeply. I have to trust that my vulnerability by literally standing in front of them naked is not gonna be met with judgment, arrogance, or disappointment. And in that way, I can keep moving toward them. So how do you get over it? Tammy, you're, I'm gonna leave that. I have some ideas. They have to do with 12-step programs and practice, but maybe you have some thoughts about that. Well, my first thought was a little at a time. You know, I have to be willing to risk. I have to be willing to get hurt. I have to be you know, like if I keep letting my fear stop me, I'm going to always be intellectualizing. I'm always going to be disconnected. I'm no one's going to know me for who I really am. And so, so I always know that they wouldn't really like me if they knew who I really was. And so, and that's a shadow form of life that, you know, is, is not, I mean, that's what I think as active addicts, what we do. So, so if, but if I'm willing to, you know, I'm willing to say a little bit and they, it, they're willing to take that then the next time I share a little bit more you know I mean it's one of those things where it's a little at a time it isn't like and I'm going to tell you everything so that yeah you know it's off-putting so thoughts I would just say also that the opposite of intimacy in some ways is addiction because intimacy is about opening up being honest having integrity telling my truth what even if it doesn't go well and addiction is all about hiding parts of myself keeping parts of myself, myself secret compartmentalizing my life so i don't ever really have to be completely open with you because there's things you don't know about but here's the problem by the way with lying and being non-intimate is that you will never know whether you're truly loved or not because if you are close to me and i am doing things and lying to you about them then when you were kind and loving to me i'm going to say well, that's nice that they're being kind and loving, but if they knew where I was today or what I've been doing, drinking sex, whatever, they wouldn't feel this way toward me. And so in that way, when we are in our addiction, we can't accept the love and appreciation that is there, even when it's there, because we tell ourselves there are reasons why we don't deserve the love that we're getting. So it's very hard for us to be intimate with anyone in active addiction. So next question, I'm a sex addict that my wife has been aware of and helped me through for the last 30 years. My question is with 
a wife that's been aware, do you recommend a full disclosure of 30 years of acting out behaviors? Well, I'm not sure I understand the question. Is this person saying that they've been aware of their spouse's sex addiction yes. for a while? Yes. So is the disclosure cover the whole 30 years of acting out or does can you do tops of the waves or what are your, what are your thoughts? Well, I think for couples that have been together for, actually, I think that it is really important. For example, if I was doing disclosure and Tammy and I had been in an intimate relationship for 20 years and she didn't know any of it, I would certainly want her to know what had gone on during the 20 years, not any graphic detail, because I wouldn't want her to be, have that in her head, those images, but the general idea. I mean, that's what disclosure really is. Um, but, um, but I also think that it's important to disclose a little bit that happened before the relationship. Really important because every spouse feels like, would you've done this with someone else? Or is it about us? Or, you know, even if you truly believe you had nothing to do with it, every spouse still says, well, maybe if I'd done this, done this maybe I'd, if I'd done that, it would be different. And for me to explain to all of you spouses that this person had the problem before they ever met you, and they probably acted out with other people when they were younger. And if they left you, they'd act it out without you unless they get healed. It's never really about you. We have this problem from very early in life. So I think to say to you, you know, I was doing this in college. I was doing this with my first boyfriend or girlfriend. I was doing this when I got my first job. It won't make you spouses feel good, but it will help you to understand that this is really a lifelong challenge for me and not just something that is related to our relationship because of course as a partner you're going to make it personal and it is personal but but the acting out is not necessarily about you on any level it's more about my problems that have been there a long time so yes i would recommend talking about things before but tammy i don't know this thing about they've been working on this for a while and all of a sudden they're going to do disclosure and i don't quite get that but maybe you have some thoughts get professional help please and um, a disclosure is not a, a chronology of the 30 years of, and then in you know, 1993, I did this. Right, it right. isn't, it, it's categories. So getting professional help mm -hmm. will best suit, be, best guide both of you um, and support the process and build a foundation um, you know, of, of healing and trust. And we're almost out of time, but you've got to answer this one, okay? Okay, okay. Hi, Dr. Rob, I'm one of those people who picks unavailable people. This is a quote you've used before, decorates them in Christmas lights and slowly starts finding perceived flaws. I'm 60 years old and have never had healthy relationships. I started ACA and go to therapy a few months ago, but I'm feeling very discouraged. I'm also isolated and have no friends. Any insights that you have would be welcome. So, Well, it's sad for me to hear that you don't have friends if you're going to adult children, you're going to ACA because... I mean, that could be the foundation of where you create meaningful friendships is with those people who've also been through a similar experience. I think the first, other than some things, some you know, friendships that grew out of life experiences like college or whatever, almost everyone in my life is someone who's touched by 12 step in some way. And I have found the most reliable, honest, caring, committed people who are addicts. You see, here's the deal we have to work at it. We have to work at honesty, integrity. You know, we have to think about it a lot. And in some ways we can be more supportive and real than someone who isn't an addict once we really kind of get that. Um, but I also want to say something about the dating. Um, so you can't date unless you have other people in your life who are there to support you. I don't recommend it. Look, you told me yourself and you told us for 60 years, you've been picking the wrong people. It ain't going to be any different next year or the year after that. But maybe if you go out with someone and then you have friends who you tell about it and you ask them, should I go out on another date with this person? You know all about my history. This is who I've loved in the past. And they will guide you rather because I think a lot of us have what I would call a bad picker. We don't always pick the right person for us, but other people who are not involved in all that romantic, oh, I'm looking in their eyes. And, you know, I know folks who are love addicts and who have this problem. And we, we sit across the table from someone and say, well, it doesn't matter to me that you're a heroin addict and still living with your partner and, you know, have an unresolved disease. You're so cute and your eyes are so, you know, that's where some people lose the balance between intellect and emotion. And they get so emotionally involved in their decisions that they're not able to parse the right ones from the wrong ones. And that's when you need other outside people to help you make those decisions. Hey, Tammy, I know we got to run. Thank you for doing this. Thank you. And a couple of you, I really wanted to get to your questions. Um, feel free to email me. Um, the, the one about the father issues 
email me. I've got a couple of links to some resources for you. Tammy, T-A-M-I at seekingintegrity.com. Dr. Rob, always lovely to um, see you and work with you. And for those, thank you for all the great questions. Come back, ask them early so we can get to them. Um, but, but we'll be here next week. And there'll be more groups every single day of this week yes. on sex and relationship healing. So stop by and it's free and we don't take yes. notes. Yes. <laughs> Have Thank a great you. evening. Thank you. Bye. Bye.